اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین و بھی نستعین والصلاة والسلام على خیر خلق اللہ بالقاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى اہل بیتہ الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین اما بعد فقط قال اللہ سبحانہ وتعالی فی کتابه الكریم اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم انما هذه الحیاة الدنیا متاع پلیز ریسائٹ الصلوات ریسپیکٹڈ لسنرز مائی دے برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ Throughout the history, there has been a concept that different civilizations and religions have been fascinated with and captivated by. And that is the concept of an era that would be, that would have characteristics and it would be marked by unprecedented challenges and profound changes. And that era in all religions, in all civilizations, or virtually all civilizations, was known as the end of times. So the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Romans, the Mayans, the Incans, all those civilizations, they talked about it. And of course, then the religions, the Abrahamic faiths, the, the Judaism talks about it, the Christianity talks about it. And of course, in Islam, the end of times has a special significance. And in Islam, the end of times is called Akhir Zaman. And as I said, this is going to be an era marked with challenges, tribulations, tests, and profound changes. Very different and unique sort of era. And it would be difficult to navigate life in that era. Therefore, all prophets talked about it, and more so, our holy prophet, the final messenger of Allah, and after that, the holy imams, talked about the end of times, how we should live life in the end of times, and we need to have a set of rules that can help us navigate those times because we are definitely living in the end of times. And I'm gonna talk more about what is the end of times and why do we say that we are living in the end of times. This is what I'll talk about in a bit. But, as I said, very important to have a set of rules that can help us navigate life in the end of times. And there can be many rules, but for this occasion, I have selected three rules that I have inferred on the basis of the Qur'an and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. And I'm gonna share those three rules with you today. Insha'Allah, that is going to help all of us navigate life in these times that are challenging and that are going to become more and more challenging in the future. So if you pay attention today, you're going to learn a few things that are going to help you deal with life in these times and also improve our spirituality improve our religiosity and also help us define a purpose, a goal, an overarching meaning as we live in these times, inshallah. And in the end, so there are going to be three rules that I'm going to discuss one by one. And in the end, inshallah, I'll give you the historical accounts of some of the events that took place on the day of Ashura and end this lecture with a eulogy, insha'Allah. But before I proceed, please recite 
allowed salawat. So, I said, end of times, akhir zaman. Are we living in the end of times? Because when we hear the term end of times, we start to talk about great wars, famines, and all those things that we have heard about that will happen on earth before the day of judgment or just before the reappearance of our Imam. And we think, okay, that is far into the future. That is not now. So we are, are we really living in the end of times? What is the end of times? So let's take a look at the definition of the end of times. You see, the things that we hear about, the end of times in terms of things that will happen just before the reappearance of the Imam, they are about the end of the end of times. The end of times is a long period, a long era. And when did it start? So there are two points of view about the end of times. First, the end of times started with the final messenger of Allah coming to this world. Because he is the final messenger. Our holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Therefore, he is also called Nabi Akhirul Zaman, the prophet of the end of times. So one point of view is that the end of times started when the Holy Prophet was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this period will continue until the day of judgment. So that's one point of view. The second point of view is that which is more Shia theological point of view, although the first point of view is also valid. But then we talk about the 12th Imam, that the end of time started with the occultation of the 12th Imam, the master of our times, the Imam of our times, Hadrat Qa'im, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. So when the Imam went into the occultation, the end of time started and will last until the day of judgment. When the time comes to an end, well, that's a philosophical discussion when the time started and when it will end. But when, let's say, this world, this our life will come to an end, the, world, the life of this world. So these are the two points of view. So therefore, we are definitely living in the end of times. How long this is going to last, we don't know. We don't know. The end of the end of times is we say for simplicity's sake that this period will come to an end. When the final Messiah reappears, then this period will come to an end. How long will this last? We don't know. 2,000 years? 5,000 years? 10,000 years? Two days? No one knows. So that we don't know. But we are certainly living in the end of times and we are living in a times that are, that are moving more and more towards the end of the end of times, as we see in the narrations. The narrations tell us how would be the circumstances and prevailing conditions in the world during the end of times. And when we see those ahadith, they also tell us how we should live our life in those times and on the basis of those ahadith i have selected these three rules that are gonna help us greatly inshallah so the first rule which is very very important the very basic rule is what i have inferred from a hadith attributed to our master our seventh imam Imam Musa al kazim alayhi salam. Please recite the salam. A part of that hadith says that the Imam said, keep praying and say more and more frequently, Allahumma la taj'alni min al Very strong. 
The Imam says, pray to Allah. Oh Allah, please don't make me among the Mu'areen. And I'm going to unfold this term for you. Mu'areen who take their religion, Ariyatan, those who borrow their faith. The Imam says, if I may paraphrase, do not rely on a borrowed faith. Rule number one, do not rely on a borrowed faith. The Imam knew what kind of challenges we were going to face. We're living in times where religion is becoming more and more part-time activity and pastime activity. When faith becomes a part-time activity and a pastime activity, it is a borrowed faith. When Muharram comes, we come to the mosque, we attend the majlis, outside of the four walls of the mosque or the Husseiniyah, when we get out, we leave the faith back there. We leave the faith. When the month of Ramadan comes, we borrow the faith again. We borrow the faith again. Then everything is good. We want to be kind. We want to be nice. We recite the Quran. We fast somehow. When the Eid comes, we return the borrowed faith. When a shahada or wilada of an imam comes, when Fatimiyah comes, again we borrow the faith. Then we leave it then and there and return to our lives. And the imam says, do not have a borrowed faith because in the end of times, the hadith says very severe words that in the end of times, people will be mu'min in the morning and kafir in the evening. Mu'min in the evening and kafir in the morning. And then the Holy Prophet said in the end of times, it will be more easy for someone, easier for someone to hold a burning coal in their palm than to keep their faith intact and preserved. Losing faith every day, every day. Aren't we living in those times? Compromising on our faith every day, every day. And we are not aware of it. We are really not. That we are living on the basis of a borrowed faith. So how can this borrowed faith be turned into a permanently owned faith. When we move away from things that we have inherited, or we do this only because we identify as such, but our faith is rooted in deep reflection and internalization of concepts. Only then we won't have a borrowed faith. Because things that are superficial, they are washed away very quickly. Trees that don't have firm roots, they very easily fall off. Very easily. We need to work on our faith. No ariya, ariyatan, not minal mu'areen. Own the faith. Keep the faith and it's not going to be easy. In these times when we are bombarded with all sorts of ideologies, all sorts of thoughts, all sorts of questions, all sorts of things that are being whispered into our chests, around our hearts, in the form of all those thoughts and ideas that those shayateen al ins the satans, the devils among the human beings are spreading and propagating and attacking our youth, our children, 
our older brothers and sisters, you and me, creating doubts, sowing the seeds of doubts into the land of our hearts so that we can give up this faith. Sometimes they want us to leave the Ahlul Bayt. Sometimes they want us to leave our prophet. We are nothing without our prophet. We are nothing without our book, the Quran. Sometimes they cast the doubts about the holy book. Sometimes they cast doubts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we did not have that firm faith and we had this borrowed faith, just because we have the culture of going to majlis, I'm afraid. I'm afraid one day we might fall a victim to those things. And I've seen people, God forbid, I've seen people who were very active members of the communities, very active members, but it was a cultural practice, cultural practice. And as soon as they were bombarded with those ideologies and a little doubt was created in their heart, they left the religion. And it is happening, my brothers and sisters. But I know you love Allah. You love the Quran. You love the Ahlul Bayt. And you do not want to have a borrowed faith. You don't. But just know that. That we all need to continuously work on our faith. And you know, these majlises are the arena for us to convert that borrowed faith into a permanent faith. No matter how little participation someone does in these majlises, these majlises, we have started to take these majlises for granted. Believe me that there are people, and I know some people personally, who had a borrowed faith. They had a borrowed faith, and they were on the verge of losing that borrowed faith. And they even committed sins. But one thing they never stopped. And that was to attend the majlis of Hussein on the day of Ashura. One day a year. Just one day a year. And Hussein pulled them back. They had borrowed this faith for one day, but the power of Hussein, just because they never stopped going to the majlis of Hussein, one day a year, Imam Hussein alayhi salam pulled them back because he has that power, the power of love, the power of affection the power of compassion. So never stop coming to these majlises, my brothers and sisters. And on top of that, work to get that iman, that iman that is not borrowed. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number four, tells us that what kind of iman Allah wants us to have. Allah does not want us to become merely mu'min. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to become merely mu'min. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said in verse number 4 of Surah Al-Baqarah, talking about those who have yu'minuna bil ghaib, those people who are muttaqeen, who get guidance from the Qur'an, and they believe in ghaib, in the unseen, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they do infaq from the risk we have given to them. They do charity. They believe in the books we have descended. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبِلْ آخِرَتِهُمْ يُقِنُونَ Not يُؤْمِنُونَ And they believe surely with yaqeen and certainty that akhirah is going to take place. That there is a hereafter. Because Iman is precarious. I just told you the hadith. Mu'min in the morning, kafir in the evening. But the one who is muqin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to Ibrahim alayhi salam that he was among the muqinin, not mu'minin. 
the one who is mu'min, he cannot be the leader of the mu'minin. The one who is mu'min, mu'min, who has yaqeen, he becomes amirul mu'minin and imamul muttaqin because he has such a yaqeen that he says, لَوْ كُشِفَ الْغِطَاءَ مَزْدَتُ يَقِينًا If all the veils were removed from before me, my yaqeen wouldn't increase even a bit because I have reached the maximum level of surety and certainty already. The Amir al muminin Ali alayhi salam, we are his followers. Yaqeen, my brothers and sisters, yaqeen. And that yaqeen does not come with this inherited faith. It comes with reflection, learning things on a profound level and deeper level. And I have spoken about it a little bit yesterday as well, what we need to do adhering to the fundamentals. So first rule in the end of times, no borrowed faith, but making the faith permanent. And the Majlis of Hussain is a great means to attain that. Rule number one. Rule number two, which I'm going to spend some time on now, very relevant and very important, my brothers and sisters. And this is something that we all struggle with. And rule number two is, again, something I've inferred, inferred on the basis of hadith. Value every moment of your life. And I'm going to unfold it. Value every moment of your life. Because the hadith tells us there is going to be no barakah in time in the end of times. No barakah in a time. The hadith says a year will be like a month. A month will be like a week. A week will be like a day. A day will be like an hour. Don't you feel that? No baraka. What is baraka? What does baraka mean? Baraka basically means less is more. When less seems more. Meal for one person and three people eat it and everybody feels full. We say what a baraka. That baraka what Allah sends. Like in Dhul Ashira, the Holy Prophet brought when he invited his relatives and he brought milk and meat and it was little meat and little milk and the whole tribe ate the Quraysh and it was still there. That is baraka. Less is more. But when there is bi barakati, when it is the antonym of baraka, more looks less. And that is what is happening. In the end of times, the whole life is full of the antonym of baraka, more so time, time. And you ask your friends nowadays, you ask me, I ask you, ask your colleagues, so how was your day, mate? How, what have you done today? Very busy, very busy. So what have you produced today? Uh, I don't know. What have you done today? Nothing really tangible, nothing useful, nothing productive. So what have you done? Been very busy, very busy doing what? Doing what? And I've seen this happening, this bi barakati. 40 years ago when I was a kid, I used to go to my ancestral village. We'd wake up in the morning, we'd go to the fields, maybe pluck some fruit, and then we'd come home, then we'll have breakfast, then we'll play cricket, and so many hours have passed, and we'll say, what's the time? Only nine o'clock. Only nine o'clock. The whole day is still there. And you have felt the same. The older generation knows what I'm talking about. Even in my teenagers. So much time, but now you wake up. Soon it is 10. Soon it is 12, 1, 2, 3. What have you done today? All the deliverables, all the homework. Nothing gets done. Despite all these tools at our disposal, nothing gets done. So many distractions, so many things happening. 
so much lack of focus. This is be barakati in the end of times. This is the lack of barakah in the end of times, my brothers and sisters. And on top of that, we are bored. We are bored. As if we have got a lot of time on our hands. We are finding ways to kill time because we have got a lot of it, right? So much of it, we have to kill it. We are deceiving ourselves. Really? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the holy book, a part of verse number 39 of Surah Al-Ghafir, Surah Ghafir, I recited in the opening sermon, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Innama hathil hayatu dunya mata'a Indeed, the life of this dunya, this world, is matar, fleeting joys, short-lived enjoyment. And that's what we are running after. Every day, whether it is that 30-second clip, whether it is some video game, whether it is some WhatsApp messages or discussion, we are wasting our life. We're wasting every moment of our life. And life is slipping through our hands. It is slipping through our hands. In the end of times, dhikr of Allah is disappearing from our lives. And on all these silly things, and shaitan is keeping us busy. Member of this WhatsApp group, member of that WhatsApp group, sitting with friends, this chat, that chat, getting involved in religious discussions, thinking that we are doing the work of God, but we are playing into the hands of shaitan. When religious activity, when religious groups and discussions become an arena for negativity, toxicity, and continuous ghaybah, continuous gossip about that Maulana said this, that Zakir said this, that Maulana this, that president this, that brother this, our community is going down the drain. Negativity, negativity, no dhikr of Allah, just self-projection and negative talk, toxicity, pulling legs of others. You call this religious activity? You are killing time playing into the hands of shaitan. You are better off watch some good art film instead of that, you might learn something valuable instead of that activity, religious activity, in the name of faith. Killing time, wasting time, and death comes just like this. Just like this. One hadith of Imam Hussain alayhi salam attributed to him. The Imam says, and I paraphrase into English, the Imam says, in the end, it will be as if the dunya never happened. And all there will be is akhirah. It never happened. This is a mirage. We are living a mirage. We are all running after a mirage. Making these petty things so important. Wasting our valuable time after petty things. And death comes just like that. You will be forgotten. I will be forgotten. Dust in dust. Someone else will be reciting this majlis. Someone else will be listening to majlis. Waqt ke sailab mein har khush ko tar beh jayega. In the flood of time, every dry and wet shall be washed away. Ha magar name. Hussain ibn Ali reh jayega. Only the name of Hussain shall remain there. We'll all be forgotten. And you're fighting over those silly things, petty things, wasting your valuable time. In these end of times, my brothers and sisters, we need to remind ourselves of this. And then uh, the quality of our life will improve. Akhirah is the key. Akhirah is the key, my brothers and sisters. There is this narration, there is this story. It is attributed to Fakhre Razi. Fakhre Razi, a great Sunni Mufassir. It is said that he wrote in his tafsir, and I haven't seen it with my own eyes. Some people say he didn't, 
or maybe it was a story he made up. But anyway, something very beautiful. What a metaphor. Fakhre Razi says, according to this narration, that one day I went to the market and I understood the meaning of Surah Al-Asr. Indeed, all human beings are at loss. When I went to the market, I saw cobbler was busy in his work. At the iron, uh, the blacksmith was busy in his work. The shopkeepers, they were busy in their shops. And there was not much hue and cry. They were all busy peacefully in their work, except one guy, the ice seller. The ice seller war was crying out loud, please come, come and buy from me. Buy from me, otherwise it will melt away. Otherwise it will melt away. I don't know how true this story is, but it is said that someone asked an Arif, tell us, tell us about the story of life. And he said, what should I tell you about life? It is like the story of an ice seller. Someone asked him, did you sell something? And he said, no, but it vanished anyway. But it vanished anyway. Allah is waiting for us to buy our life from us. Something we can sell to him. Something valuable, something small but done for him, and he's going to give huge price, unlimited price for it. Do we have anything to sell to him? It's vanishing, slipping through our hands, and we are busy in all these fleeting joys. Fleeting joys, my brothers and sisters. Please recite a salawat. Oh, 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 oh.